After the success of our rocket mass heater video collaboration, my neighbor Stefano called me up and he said, hey, I want to build a dust crete sauna. And I said, well, you're talking my language, I'm in. So we talked about uh, the design considerations, did some research on YouTube and elsewhere to find out what is important in sauna design. And then we went over to another friend's farm and did a, a sweat with him and his sauna. And that had some features that we liked and uh, some things that I would have done differently. But here's a look at that sauna. This deck is nice. Wrap around. He's got his cold plunge there and a wood-fired hot tub in the back here overlooking the orchard. You can see down at the corner of the building here is the air inlet for the combustion. So two vents are critical. That one, and you can see this one down by the door here, that's the exit vent. And having them at those heights allows the steam to swirl in the upper area of the sauna and evacuate and keep the air fresh. You can see we're running about 170 degrees in the sauna. We have a local mill that makes this uh, aspen tongue and groove. A lot of people use cedar in these saunas, but uh, this aspen also works great. Some people are actually allergic to cedar, so aspen is a more universally acceptable wood for something like this. And if you build your sauna right, you will not have any problems with rotting. So he's got his benches, nice slate floor, slate uh, surround for his stove. It's a good size. The one thing I didn't really like about this was this uh, treated 4x4 and paver foundation. I think that uh, the flex that this creates in the building may also contribute to the trouble being had with the stucco. So I got on SketchUp and drew up a whole set of framing plans. There's a link to those down below in the comments if you'd like to pick those up. And also put together a uh, spreadsheet, a Google spreadsheet, for all of the materials necessary for this project. That's also in that same link if you want to check that out. So in this series, we're going to go through every phase of the construction of this building for OG Dustcrete fans. You'll get to see a lot of details. There are some things that I did in this build I've been wanting to try, uh, including a ceiling of Dustcrete that we have in the sauna. So it was the first time that I had done an internal subframe and a full envelope of Dustcrete around that. And so we'll talk about all those aspects as it relates to that material uh, when we get to that part in the series. But I'll release these uh, about once a week or so, and you guys can watch along. While Stefano was getting his chicken coop out of the way of our building site, I went down to the gravel yard. We wanted to put an insulative layer of volcanic rock underneath this building. And this ornamental landscape lava rock comes from New Mexico, and so it costs 120 a ton, whereas this basalt leech rock is 15 a ton. So we loaded up a couple tons of that in the truck, and we took it back to the job site to lay underneath our bond beam foundation. So the site is roughed out with a skid steer. I just went in and removed some roots and then measured out where the corners would be and laid a six mil plastic sheet down. When it comes to foundations, my ultimate favorite uh, style of foundation is a rubble trench with a French drain in the bottom and a reinforced concrete bond beam on the top. Now for a small structure like this, this is under 200 square feet, the rubble trench and French drain are not really necessary. There's going to be adequate drainage on the base layer of gravel here. And if this thing were to ever rack or heave or, or get out of uh, plumb and level, simple enough just to slip a jack underneath that bond beam and lift it up where you need to and, and then backfill with tamped gravel. And then that should last you another 10 years. But the whole thing because of that reinforced bond beam, you could pick it up with a crane and move it somewhere else or possibly even skid it if it wasn't for the uh, earthen floor that's on the inside. At any rate, with this 
you know, relatively light building, this uh, reinforced bond beam is more than adequate foundation and because of the gravel underneath, it can drain very well. I shoveled all the basalt gravel out of the truck and got a nice four inch layer on top of our vapor barrier of plastic here. This creates an isolation of the thermal mass of the earthen floor, which then acts as a thermal battery within the building. So there's the lumber bunk for this project. It will fit inside of the bed of a standard pickup truck. I kept everything at eight foot lengths to make it easy for you guys. A few tens in there. And then when I framed up the uh, form here, I made sure to not cut anything I didn't have to so that I could then reuse these form boards as rafters in this structure. So I got everything leveled with stakes and got the perimeter established. I started on the high side where the frame is closest to the ground and got that one side good and level and then raise the downhill side to match. There is a little slope to the building site here, which is good because that would allow any water that were to get underneath this bond beam to be able to drain out. Always important to pull your corners, make sure that you're square before setting this last corner. And then we got to work on framing the inside of this bond beam form. Stefano is back fiddling around the outside of the form where we're too high off the ground to hold the concrete. To get the inside form level to the outside form, just run that level across the two legs of the outside form and bring the corner of the inside form up to it. Set the screw in the stake and there we go. We have a nice level plane to start our building from. Fortunately, had this tree here as a handy rebar bender. So we've been up some half inch rebar, tied it off, just a single course here. And I had these little uh, rebar chairs rattling around the farm, so I thought we'd use those. And then got on to mixing concrete. You can see all the lime stacked up there. There's also a bunch of Portland cement for the dust creek portion of this. The materials on this build ended up running right about $3,500 uh, minus the stove and um, the labor hours were about 100 man hours between Steph and myself. And that's done was packed into the forms and, and trial it off nice and flat. I did pull a bullnose edge around the outside and inside of the whole thing so we won't have things flaking off. Tapping it with the hammer to get any air bubbles out, get that concrete to settle down in there. And there we are, full. Let that sit for about 48 hours and then came back and strip the forms. Getting these inside ones out is always tricky, but I tried to make whatever cuts I needed to make at the ends of boards so that I would still have enough length in each of these to use as a rafter in the framing of this building. It's going to be as efficient as possible with the material, keep the cost down and not be ridiculously wasteful. You can see that uh, plaster mixer in the back there. Stefano found that on Facebook Marketplace for less than a thousand dollars and knew they cost uh, ten to twelve thousand so that was quite a score for making the dust creep. And there are the forms waiting to be reused. And there is our finished bond beam. This pile of material here is road base, three-quarter road base, so it's gravel, sand, and just a little bit of clay. And so Stefano is going to load that into the bond beam, and then he went through with a plate compactor. You want to have about five inches minimum of this road base underneath an earthen floor. It makes the perfect substrate and very stable, particularly once it's compacted with a plate compactor. 
Well, there we have it. We're ready for framing, and so you can tune into the next episode and check that out. Remember, there are links below for the framing plans and a 3D model and the spreadsheet for this project. Subscribe and hit that bell if you want to be alerted to new episodes.